Our text this morning is still Proverbs 4.23. Take another swing at that this morning. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. We began exploring this proverb last week. It tells us above all to guard our hearts, our hearts being the seed of our thoughts, and motives, words, and behaviors. And we started by answering the why of the imperative. Why is it such a priority for us to keep our heart? And we first saw that it's because the heart is valuable. God doesn't ask us to guard worthless things. And then we notice that the heart also is vulnerable, that when the heart is captivated for good by God, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful force. But when it's captivated by folly and foolishness, it's a source of sorrow and destruction heart is vulnerable. We also noted that the heart is vital. Everything about us flows from the heart. The heart is a great reservoir. If we were to borrow Spurgeon's words, our thoughts, our words, and our actions flow from our hearts. So that answers the why we should guard our hearts. And today we're going to take a stab at the how. We're going to try to bring this proverb down to street level if we can. And, uh, Explore how do we obey this command? How does one keep a heart? To that end, I'm going to offer six ways this morning for you to keep your heart. The first way to keep a heart, to, to guard a heart, that's what that word means, right? Is to protect, preserve, maintain, is to pay attention to it. Is to pay attention to it. I've been driving around this week with a little message on my dashboard. It says, change engine oil soon. Anybody ever had that? kind of message show up. So I look at the sticker, and sure enough, it's not just time to change the engine oil. It's past time to change the engine. My truck, turns out, my truck is right. Um, although I don't appreciate my truck telling me what to do or giving me another task, it's probably a good thing that it does that. Because if it didn't, I don't know that I would pay attention. And you all know, uh, probably, that if you don't change the oil, a vehicle's engine, and it's bound to do harm to that engine, and if, God forbid you forget all about the oil in an engine, then it just makes that engine seize up. And so there's good reason to pay attention to the light on my dashboard, or the message on my dashboard. Now think about your heart sort of as an engine. It drives everything. Everything's coming out of it. Okay, It drives everything. And think of the issues that I brought up last week that sort of betray what's going on inside of our hearts. When we get quickly angered at mild offenses, when we use harsh or critical words, when we don't really need to, but they're right on the tip of our tongue. We could add to that any number of things, like when we're prone to envy, when we're prone to jealousy, if we are worrying inordinately about something. Those are all indicators that our heart is in some sort of disorder. Something's out of order. And so those are, uh, to, those are the check engine lights of our hearts. When they arise, rather than just dismiss them or minimize them or pretend that it wasn't you who did or said those things, what you want to do is own them and say, okay, this is telling me something about what's going on inside of me. I have to pay attention to the thoughts that I'm having and the words that I'm using in the behaviors that I'm choosing. English Bible teacher A.W. Pink has said, for the Christian to keep his heart means for him to pay close attention to the direction in which his affections are moving, to discover whether the things of the world are gaining a firmer and fuller hold over him, or whether they are increasingly losing their charm for him. So keeping our hearts then begins with paying attention to what our hearts are telling us. Secondly, a second way for us to keep a heart is to fill it with what is good and right. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 22, we read this, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my saying. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for their life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. Our spiritual heart health hinges on what we fill our hearts with. And the wisdom of God tells us to fill them with God's word. Theologian Charles Bridges offers useful advice here. He says that we should live daily in the atmosphere of God's Word. We should live daily in the atmosphere of God's Word. 
Psalm 119, verse 9 asks, How can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That 11th verse you might have learned in the King James, I did. Thy word I have hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We keep our hearts when we keep them open to God and when we fill them with godly things, when we fill them with God's word. And we do this through a regimen that includes a spiritual discipline, spiritual disciplines of prayer, Bible reading, worship, Christian fellowship. I'm always leery when I come to say something like that in the context of a sermon because I feel like it's probably, A, already been said many times, you've heard it, and perhaps B, is so familiar to you that you're not going to hear it this time. Of course the pastor's going to get up there and tell me that I need to pray and read the Bible and go to church and, and fellowship. So I feel like sometimes when I say that, I'm like, when you go to the doctor, right, this has got to happen to all of us. We go to the doctor. We want the doctor to do right by us. We want him to fix us or make us well. And the doctor looks us over and pretty much almost always it's like, well, yeah, this is what you need to do. You need to eat right and exercise. I don't want to hear that, right? That's like blah, 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 blah. And so it is when a pastor stands up and says, you know, you guys really got to focus in on the spiritual discipline. Blah, 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 blah. But no, it's really, it's truly, the reason we keep coming back to those fundamentals is because they're fundamental. And they are absolutely foundational. And if we want a heart that is kept for God, that is ordered to right, then we must pay attention to the word. We have to be prayerful. We've got to find connection with God's people. And we need to make worship a priority in our lives. No question about it. Well, we open ourselves up to the good things. That's one way to keep our heart. And the flip side of that is we close ourselves to the things that are harmful and hurtful. That we starve our, we want to feed our hearts with God's word, but we want to starve our hearts when it comes to the things of the world, the things that are evil, the things that are wrong. God's word says that we are to be watchmen over our own hearts. It gives us that responsibility. So, so picture that, if you would. You're, you're the watchman. You're the watch person over your own heart. You're on the city gate, or you're in the watchtower of your own heart. That's the image of the watchman. A watchman's supposed to be awake. A watchman's supposed to be vigilant. A watchman's supposed to be paying attention, right? Supposed to be sober and alert. What if the watchman nods off? What if the watchman sees danger coming but decides that it's not that big a deal? Or what if the watchman is somehow bribed to turn his head one way or the other and not acknowledge this danger or threat? Well then, the alarm is not sounded, the city gate is not closed, the troops are not mustered, the intruders breach, they make their way in, and violence ensues. So that's all just a figurative way of what happens if you or I nod off on this watch. What happens if we turn our heads? What happens if we minimize something and say something's wrong really isn't that wrong? What happens if, God forbid, we fling the gate open to what doesn't belong in our lives in, in the way of sin and immorality? It's not going to be a good thing. All of us has to be have to be vigilant to the threats that are out there. There are many. They come in lots of shapes and sizes and lots of forms. Certainly can't go through a bunch of them today, but there are some common ones we should be aware of. For instance, we must guard our hearts against bad counsel from friends. Did you know that good friends can give bad advice? Uh, <laughs> in fact, sometimes it's because we're such good friends that we give bad advice. If we really love someone. We want to please them, and we kind of maybe inclined then to tell them what we believe they want to hear, but that could be the wrong thing. So we have to guard our hearts always against bad counsel, wherever it comes from. Then we have to guard our hearts against bitterness. It comes from disappointments. This is a hard world to live in. Things don't always work the way that we want them to. Sometimes we experience some pretty deep hurts. And if we have expectations that have been crushed, we may then be beyond sad, we might become bitter. And we have to guard our hearts against that. Scripture says, see to it that no root of bitterness, you don't allow any root of bitterness 
to grow up in there because if you do, it says it's going to defile many. That if, if we let bitterness come in, that anger takes hold. It's not just going to bother me. It's going to impact everybody around me. That's the way it goes. There's also this fear of the unknown. We have to guard our hearts against that. We really do see through a glass darkly. That's what Paul said. That's, we just don't get the full picture. We'd like to have the full picture. And then there's so many unknowns, and they can cause us to be fearful. And we have to guard our hearts against that fear and remember who's holding on to it, who's loving us and leading us. But the fear of the unknown is, is, can be a paralyzing thing for some people. Well, then it goes beyond the fear of the unknown, actually kind of turns into anxiety. Because it's not just that we don't know what's going to be next. We worry, we begin to worry that what we want to have happen isn't going to happen next. That's anxiety. So we're afraid of the unknown, but then it turns into something even more than that. Because now I, I've got a plan, but what if that doesn't? You see, there are so many things, and I could go on and on and on, but we can guard our hearts against these things because they're dangerous. Now, I do want to mention one thing that I think is probably more prevalent than any of these, at least for a mixed crowd like ours. That's something to be careful of, a contemporary danger that faces most of us when it comes to keeping our hearts. And that is the amount of media that we ingest on a given day, in a given time. What messages are you taking in? What issues are you allowing to take up space in your heart and in your mind? T.D. Gordon has written an interesting book called Why Johnny Can't Preach. And he's talking about the media that shapes the messenger. He's talking about how uh, our constant diet of news is actually leading us to become a people who lack the ability to discern what is significant from what is insignificant. And we spend our time and energy wound up about the insignificant or unable to communicate what is significant. I'd like you to think about that, whether that's true or not. Um, it seems to me that it, it is. When, when outlets are determining what constitutes news, do you ever wonder that sometimes when you're watching the news, you're watching the newscast, you're like, who decided this was news? If you haven't, I wish you would, because somebody is. It's important to kind of understand, take a step back and go, somebody's decided that this is what should be in front of a large audience. Today. Somebody is deciding. And I'm not, I'm not assigning awful motives to anybody. Yeah, I'm just saying that's the way it works. Somebody has to decide what runs and what doesn't run. Somebody has to determine what's important or not important or what ought to capture one's attention or maybe ruling out. That's not a good story. That's not going to get anybody interested in what's going on. It used to be a whole thing, right? If it bleeds, it leads. And now if you monitor any local news forecast, it seems to bleed for the first 15 minutes. What are we to do when organizations have an agenda to shape a reality? In a recent interview, Chris Martin, who is the manager of social media at Lifeway Christian Resources, said this. He said, I've changed my mind away from thinking social media platforms are neutral tools as I have done more research about the inner workings of social media platforms and the motives with which they've been created and are perpetuated. Just recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that Facebook ignored internal research that proved its algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to devices. Why would they ignore such research? Because it's not profitable to make changes based on that research. Because what they're doing is working for what they want to accomplish. Alan DeBotton has written a book called The News, A User's Manual, in which he writes, societies become modern when news replaces religion as our central source of guidance and our touchstone of authority. In the developed economies, the news now occupies a position of power at least equal to that formerly enjoyed by the faith. We approach it with some of the same deferential expectations we would have harbored for the faiths. Here, too, we hope to receive revelations, learn who is good and bad, fathom suffering, and understand the unfolding logic of existence. And here, too, if we refuse to take part in the rituals, there could be imputations of heresy. Well, that's an interesting take. Whether you agree with it or not, in light of Proverbs 4.23, I think it's still worth considering if and how the media might be impacting your heart. Are you being informed 
or are you being formed? To be informed is to take in information, to take in news, to be formed. Well, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. I am not, I have to throw in a disclaimer here because it would be easy probably for you to walk out and say, well, pastor said that I couldn't watch the news or I shouldn't scroll through Facebook. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying you can't watch a newscast. I'm not saying you can't scroll through or ought not scroll through Facebook. Um, there's a new series actually out on Right Now Media, Kyle Eidelman, called Redeem the Screen. It's a biblical perspective on screen time. And I'd encourage you to take a look. It's short. It's, I think it's three sessions. It's just good, basic information, tools for our toolbox as Christians trying to walk circumspectly in this world. So I'd recommend that to you. I'm not saying that we need to go get a barrel and uh, bring in the screens and, and douse them and torch them up. You know, it's, it's not a screen-burning call. But what I am asking you to do is to think through your screen time, your media time, with an awareness every time you power up that this could be, this could be good. This could be for my good. But it could also be for my heart. So I just need to be aware. There's a danger. And the Apostle Paul said it best in, in 1 Corinthians 6. He certainly wasn't talking about media. But the Bible's timeless. Have you noticed that too? I mean, the Scripture applies. And he says this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Another way you may have learned that. All things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be dominated. He says, I will not find myself under the control of anything. So a question we can ask ourselves in evaluating time spent in front of screens is, am I in control of this or is this in control of me? Am I in control of this or is this in control of me? And one of the tests of that is to kind of not just, you can, for one, you can monitor the times that you, you spend on these screens. There are plenty of apps that will let you do that. And you may actually be getting things in your inbox that tell you that you don't even want to know. Like Google Analytics tells me what I do. I'm like, oh, how do you know? Mr. Google has me. Um, so you can figure that out. But you don't even need to do that. I think you can do it anecdotally. One, you could ask the person you love the most, do I spend too much time in front of a screen? You don't ask a quality time person because the answer is always yes. My wife picked out her phone to check a phone number. I put that away. I jealously guard that time. Um, so you can, but you can do it anecdotally that way. You can also just kind of think about how do you start your day. And a lot of people have fallen into this habit. This research says it's not a very good habit, which is why I'm sharing it with you, is that the first thing they access in the morning is the phone. And so you wake up, and of course, that's because your alarm is on your phone. And you reach over and you grab the phone. But then you check your messages. You check your email. You're not even out of bed yet. And you're trying to see, does so-and-so like the post that I made last night? How many of these am I? Are you in control of this? Or is it in control of you? Is this exposure? Think about this. Is this exposure good for my heart? Does this make me a more godly person? Does it make me a better Christian? Does it help me to think more highly of others? Do I need this to be faithful to the calling that God has placed on my life? Just think through those things. Do you remember when, maybe this happened to you, it happened to me, when our parents used to tell us not to sit too close to the TV. Did that ever happen to anybody else? How many people? It looks like a common affliction. Yes, okay, it is. Yeah. Back up. Is that good for your eyes? I don't know why, but I always was that kid that sat like right here. So I was regularly getting that. Back up. That's not good for you. And maybe it's not. I don't know. I never, I never investigated. I mean, they used to tell me if I crossed my eyes, they'd stay that way too. That's not true. You know, I was told a lot of things that aren't true. But the issue, the issue now isn't really what it's doing to our eyes, right? That screen. It's what it's doing to our heart what it's doing to our hearts. We guard our hearts by closing them to what is evil, what is wrong. A fourth way to keep your heart is this, is to listen to the counsel of the brothers and sisters in the faith. It is to listen to the counsel of our brothers and sisters in the faith. There is a reality to this lifelong heart-keeping exercise that we should not ignore and some are going to find difficult to admit, and that is that we are never intended to do this all on our own. In fact, I think the words the enemy likes to hear is, I'm going to do this by myself. 
That's a little heartbreaking for a parent. Have you ever had your kid say, you go, to, you go to help your kid, and what do they say? I can do it on my own. Really? Yeah. That's sometimes what we do to God. And it's sometimes what we do to others. They really draw alongside of us to help, and we just sort of hold them off. I got this. But we were really never intended to, to carry burdens all by ourselves. We were never intended to be the sole keeper of our hearts. Hebrews 3, 12 to 13. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. Okay, this is a letter written to believers. This is what to do. Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Did you note the frequency with which this encouragement, this exhortation, which is encouragement and warning, is supposed to be delivered? Every day. Exhort each other every day. That assumes a closeness, doesn't it? That assumes a connectedness that should be the goal of every Christian church. Not just to be a friendly church, but to be a church of friends. Friends who actually can speak into each other's lives. Friends have the right. And Christian friends have the obligation to speak into each other's lives. And the reason for God designing it that way is because we all have weaknesses. And we all have blind spots. And God loves us so much that he doesn't want to see us make a shipwreck of our lives. He loves us, and so he's given us friends, brothers and sisters, who, if they see the, the ship of uh, of our soul heading for a reef will sound the alarm and say, no, no, not that way. If they see us going down the wrong road, they love us enough to say, brother, sister, that's the wrong road. I'm imploring you, don't go down that road. Please rethink that road. Sometimes friends are like guardrails. You know? They're there for those dangerous moments when you, have, when, when you might go off the edge. And they're there to say, no, no, come this way. That's dangerous. James Dobson used to say about raising kids, he used to say, just keep them in play. Because <laughs> it it's hard to raise kids and you don't know the right thing. He's like, just keep them in play. And I always had that idea of like those bumpers at the bowling alley. They keep the ball in the lane. The kid might go all over the place. Just keep him in play. That's all we're trying to do. And, and we need friends to do that, to keep us in play. And to that, to that end, let me ask you, is there someone in your life right now who could offer a word of encouragement or correction that you would listen to? You might, you might be able to say, well, I know someone who will offer a word of correction. I have too many of those people in my life. Or maybe, yeah, a word of warning or encouragement. But the trick here isn't just to, is that person in your life. It's also are you willing to listen? Because they can tell you the truth. Brother, sister, I see your heart hardening. I see, I see your spiritual life waning. But if you're not willing to listen to them, that doesn't do any good at all. Does it? If you don't have someone like that, I want to encourage you to find someone like that. Church is a great place to find someone like that. And, and, and I, hopefully you have more than one person like that in your life. But if you don't, then I think you should. I'd ask you why you don't, and I'd encourage you to go and find that person. And here's what I would say. If you don't have that friend, then go ask someone to be your friend. Now, I know as soon as I said that, you're like, are you kidding me? That is pathetic. That is pathetic that I have to go ask someone to be my friend. I'm not that bad, I'm not that stupid, I'm not, go on and on, I get it, look. This is what I mean, because I've done this. I was pastoring a church, and it wasn't like this church with an association of pastors that I could meet with with any regularity, it was more of an independent church. It was isolated, it was on its own. I was the pastor, that was it, just me. I needed someone to speak into my life, someone to keep me straight, someone to tell me if I'm off base, someone to give me encouragement when I am discouraged. So I came to this church and I asked a man named Gene Hollis, 
who used to serve here in this church, and I said, Gene, will you be my friend? Okay, that sound pathetic? It was an excellent relationship, and it was very helpful. I needed it. And you need it too. Don't overestimate yourself. The Bible doesn't want us to do that. You need someone who can speak a word of correction, who can speak a word of instruction, and give you a word of encouragement. We need that because you and I will never have the whole perspective on things. We just won't have the perfect perspective all the time, and we don't have the awareness even sometimes to know that we don't have the right perspective. We need each other for this. But then there's something else that gets in our way while we're trying to keep our hearts. And that is sometimes it isn't just that we don't have the awareness or perspective. Sometimes we just don't have the will. Sometimes we just don't have the ability or the desire to keep our own hearts. Alexander McLaren was a Scottish preacher in the 1800s. And on this imperative here in Proverbs 4.23, he wrote this. He said, the inherent weakness of all attempts at self-keeping is that keeper and kept, being one and the same personality, the more we need to be kept, the less able we are to affect it. If in the very garrison are traitors, how shall the fortress be defended? The garrison is an old military term for the place that housed the troops. If the traitors are inside the fort, how does the fort get defended? If the enemy to be guarded against is me, and sometimes it is me, what do I do then? That is the time to call for divine assistance. That's the fifth way to keep your heart recognize a need for divine assistance. Now, I want to clarify this a little bit. Calling on God is not just a wartime strategy. As in, okay, God, I've got this, and I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to manage everything until I get to a place where I can't. And then when I get in a bind, I'm going to give you a ring. And I'm hoping you just come on, flood on in, and fix it up a little bit so that I can take it back. That's a wartime kind of strategy, right? I'm going to call when I need help. Otherwise, I'm going to handle it. But I'm saying that calling on God and recognizing divine, your need for divine assistance is also a peacetime strategy because it's an all-time strategy because we always need the Lord. We always need Him. That's why we pray on purpose, Lord, deliver us from evil. Lord, don't lead us into temptation. Lord, thy will be done. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And so we pray without ceasing all the time. We're calling on God. And we do so for many reasons. But one reason is that we, we do recognize we need his help. Sometimes that's more obvious than others, right? We call on him when we need his help. There's nothing wrong with that because we do need it. Another Scottish minister, Thomas Chalmers, penned a book, The Expulsive Power of a new affection. Doesn't that make you want to run right out and grab the book? The expulsive power of a new affection sounds very puritanistic, doesn't it? In, is that a word, puritanistic? I might have just made up a word. In which he states this, it is seldom that any of our tastes are made to disappear by a mere process of natural extinction. The heart must have something to cling to, and never by its own voluntary consent will it so denude itself of all its attachments. We need divine intervention, divine assistance to set our hearts aright because without it, we will almost certainly chase, cling to, and settle for lesser affection. Only God can change our hearts to the place that we are wanting the right things, desiring the right things, capable of doing what is right and good. God. We need God to do that for us. And that's why we want to pray for him to affect the change, right? Sometimes we get discouraged because we pray to God to change our behavior. You have responsibility for your behavior. You're not asking God to do something you ought to be doing, are you? Leave that for you and ask him to do what only he can do, which is not just change your behavior, but change what's motivating your behavior, change your heart. That's confession, God. I need you to change because this is what I'm doing, and I don't want to do it anymore. Lord, I need you to change my heart because I honestly want this more than I want you. And I know that that's wrong. And I know that's not what I was made 
to live for. I, I need you to change my heart. That's the expulsive power of a new affection. I need to want Jesus more than I want anything else. And when I don't, I just have to own that. Lord, change my heart. And ask him to change all your behavior, this, that. Yeah, change your heart, your behavior follows. That's going to happen. We need divine intervention because only God can do that kind of thing in us, and we need it. Do you remember the words of Jesus to Peter? When Peter's heart was about to be tested as it never had before. Jesus was himself being tested in that same time. He said to Peter, watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. Because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch. Stay away. Be vigilant, Jesus says. Peter, do your part. Do your part and pray. Call for divine assistance. And then rely on your Heavenly Father to do His part. And that's the final thought on the matter for today. Not just that we call on divine assistance, but that we count on divine assistance. Count on. This is a hard world to live in. A lot of pitfalls. A lot of distractions. A lot of spiritual landmines, so to speak, places where we can misstep and mess things up. It's hard to keep our hearts ordered properly. But we must keep in front of us at all times in, in our efforts of heart keeping this truth. God is for us. God is for us. God loves us so, and he is on our side. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will do what? Guard your hearts. The law requires the gospel supply. In our guarding, in all our guarding, there is another who stands guard with us. Peter wrote this in his first letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. I love that in the King James, a lively hope. We're no longer dead. It's a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Beloved, in all our people, there is another who is keeping us. So, dear ones, not only are we to call on divine assistance, we must count on it. For in the mixed results of watching our own hearts in places where we sometimes experience victory, but sometimes bitter defeat, God is faithful. Scripture says he's a very present help in times of trouble. Not only able, but willing to supply every need of our lives according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. So live today in the confidence of knowing a God who loves you, who stands ready, willing, and able to help you, and who will never, ever let 